Welcome, everyone. Wow, what an enthusiastic crowd. I don't know how many people we have in the building tonight, but you're only a part. They're all through the building in overflow and in the theater. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Jim Carrington, CEO and president of the Danforth Plant Science Center. Thank you for coming and being a critical, integral, participatory part of the third edition of Big Ideas, which is backed by popular demand. The first two in 2017 and 2019 were among the highest rated conversations programs that we've ever had here at the Danforth Center. In fact, to my knowledge, they were the two top rated since we've been measuring over the past 10 years or so. And I have a good feeling about tonight. For the past 11 weeks, nine young Danforth Center scientists working in three teams of three have been honing a big idea. One that, if implemented and with sufficient resources, would impact hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Ideas that, are, that address real challenges affecting real people, real families, and real communities. Ideas that would truly deliver on our mission to improve the human condition through plant science. The teams built ideas based on work they were already doing. They had a little bit of a head start. These are experts in the fields and in the areas that they're going to be talking about. But they were asked to expand their vision about what their work could be and the impact it could have. And each team committed to convey their big idea to you, an audience that comes through the door largely lacking the detailed scientific understanding and knowledge that they have in their area, their confusing vocabulary, uh, and their unique motivation and excitement for what they're doing. Oh, and they also agreed to do this in the form of a competition where you, the audience, gets to select the big idea and presentation that is most creative, most inspiring, and most audience connecting. This was a tall order that each team member has been devoting time and collaborative energy for 11 weeks since June 15th. We're honored that you've joined us tonight to experience the very best of the Danforth Center. Now, to kick off Big Ideas 3.0, please join me in welcoming our Master of Ceremonies, our very good friend, Chip Lurwick. Thank you, Jim. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Big Ideas. As Jim had said, this is the third iteration. So for anyone who had been to either one of the first two, uh, you know what you're in for. It's going to be a treat. But for those that have not, this is one of the most special and unique nights for the Danforth Center. These teams, as Jim had said, they're made up of scientists here. These are postdoctoral uh, scientists, our graduate students, the research associates that are working on teams and they get to shine tonight with a big idea. These are ideas they've been working on, as Jim had said, to solve for a big challenge in plant science or agriculture. And they're going to challenge you all to make that decision, as Jim had said. But first, they're going to start with working with a challenge to the panel to engage with a panel that's going to be seated in just a moment. And that panel has never heard these ideas before. And they're going to help you, the audience, by asking questions, engaging in dialogue with each of the teams after their presentation. And that will help you understand which idea is it that you feel like is worthy of your vote. And as Jim said, this is, this is a competition, and you all are the ones voting. So what we're going to do at this moment, because this is a vote, you've all been handed a clicker. And on the screen is some instructions that are going to be put up. We need to have you test, and this is only for those of you that are here in this auditorium or the Langenberg Theater. Uh, for those of you online, you'll have a survey that'll be served up during the vote. But we'd like to have you test, and what we're gonna do is divide this group into essentially three groups, and we're gonna have you vote with a one if your last name is between A and H. You vote two if your last name is between I and Q, and three, with a name between R and Z. You can just put that in at any time now. Just wanna make sure the equipment's working because uh, we wanna make sure we've got a good vote 
at the point that we need it. So everyone, thank you for that. I think uh, we should be good with our test. Okay. With that, we'll want to begin by introducing our panel. And so I'll start with Marilyn Bush. Marilyn Bush, she's the president of Bank of America, St. Louis. Dr. Benjamin Akande. Benjamin is a senior vice president at Stiefel Financial, and he's also the chair of the Danforth Leadership Council here at the Danforth Center. <laughs> Lastly, Janet Wilding. Janet is the assistant vice chancellor of economic development at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. You're going to hear a lot more from the panelists as they engage with each of the teams, but at this point, Sit back, relax, and enjoy big ideas. Each year, 40 billion tons of greenhouse gases are emitted primarily from burning fossil fuels. Deep emissions reductions are urgently needed to preserve our planet and sustain our way of life. Is there a way we can harness plants to shift and supplant our reliance on fossil fuels. Our big idea is to replace petroleum with farm-grown plant oils. I'm Poonam Jyoti from Himachal, India. I'm Somnath Kole from Kolkata, India. I'm Stuart Morley from Stillwater, Minnesota, and we're Team Ecotag from the Allen Lab. If you drove three miles, not very far, you used about this much gas to get here. But even if you drove an electric car, you still use this much gas equivalent. We all share a problem. No matter how eco-conscious we are, we are still reliant on fossil fuels. And we know this is bad because burning fossil fuels adds carbon to the atmosphere, contributing to climate change and making the planet hotter. Year after year, we experience the effects of climate change. We have observed prolonged and more violent wildfires, extreme floods, and severe storms. Most of the world has recognized this problem and committed to reduce emissions to avoid a two degree rise in global temperature by the end of this century. To achieve this, we need to reduce our emissions by 20% by 2030 and 50% by 2040. But we can do this right now. And we've had the technology for hundreds of years. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for bikes. Hmm. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> no, seriously, is that even practical? The place? <laughs> yes, that is practical, but for local communication, right? The place where I live in India, it would take me months of traveling to reach the spot where I'm standing right now. In fact, even if I lived by 10 miles away, I would spend nearly an hour each day coming and going to work. Now, the problem is, we recognize that climate change is an issue. We are still reliant on oil and gas that is causing it. We can't simply stop driving cars or flying in planes. We need a better solution. Hmm. Hold on. You to drive gas cars. I drive an electric car. No gas, no emissions. You two are part of the problem. I am part of the solution. OK, OK, stop. <laughs> You're right. You're both right. Bikes are impractical, and electric cars would be nice. That's what I said. But until we can all afford them, and until we can all charge them, we have what we have, which is mostly gas cars. Also, in 2020, over 60% of electricity generated worldwide came from fossil fuels. Oh, really? We still have a dilemma. We are deeply reliant on fossil fuels. What if we use reusable gas? 
Well, when I burn the gas, it doesn't come back. And my gas tank only fills it when I do. Like a cookie jar that magically refill itself? No, 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 no. All I'm saying is, instead of extracting oil from the ground, we could get it from our yard trimmings. Hmm. What if we could get more potential from our agricultural land and produce the oil that we need from the plants that we grow? Our big idea is to produce industrial oils in plant to reduce our reliance on petroleum. Some of you may have just said in your mind, great, it's another biofuel talk. <laughs> but let's get one thing straight. We are not talking about ethanol or biodiesel. We are talking about gasoline. We are talking about creating a feedstock that can replace petroleum. And we are going to do it in plants that would not compete with any food crops, would not take up any additional land, and most importantly, that will recycle carbon rather than just emit it. There are three major innovations to our approach which makes this different. First, we'll use the plants called cover crops. Second, rather than producing oil in plant seeds, we'll produce them in plant leaves. And third, we'll modify the structure of plant oil to make them usable fuel like petroleum. Now some of you are wondering, what are cover crops and why do we even care? Mm -hmm. hmm. So cover crops are plants that are grown on farmland but in between the growing seasons of traditional food crops. Their primary purpose is to preserve the soil so that less erosion occur when the land is not in use. They are grown late in fall, left over winter, and re-sprout in spring until being removed by the farmer to make way for traditional food crops. There are many varieties of cover crops for a variety of situations. For example, cereal rye is often planted before corn to maintain soil integrity and suppress weeds. Clovers can add nitrogen to the soil, and canola is a cover crop that produces an oily seed. Our strategy is to use advanced breeding technique to create cover crops that can produce high levels of oil. As you all know, the land we have on Earth is finite, not unlimited. By using cover crop, we can use the same land that used for the, used for the food production, but without replacing actual cover actual food crops. This differs from traditional oil production methods, which involves extracting oil as a byproduct of a food crop harvested in the fall. With our approach, we want to add another harvest earlier in the spring so that the land is used more efficiently and we can add valuable income to a farmer's revenue stream. We should acknowledge the fact that using cover crops as oil producing plants is not a completely new idea. In fact, just down the road, there is a company called Covercrest, whose whole business is selling cover crops which produce oil in seeds. Our goal is to extend that further with our second major innovation. Which is producing plant oils in leaves rather than seeds. The other day, I went to the grocery store and I bought a bottle of vegetable oil. The ingredient list was very short. Soybean oil. In fact, most of the plant oils that we use come from seeds like soybean, sunflower, or canola. The problem with seeds and cover crops is timing. A farmer's number one priority is to get their food crop planted as soon as possible. Every day that they wait can translate to a yield loss. And in farming, yield is everything. So if a farmer has to choose between planting their food crop and waiting for a cover crop to produce mature seed, they will always pick planting their food crop. There's no time to wait. That's why rather than extracting oil from plant seeds, our strategy is to produce high levels of oils on their leaves throughout their life cycle. This means we do not have to wait until plants maturity to get these oily seeds, but we can have multiple harvest of oily leaves while the plants are growing. And we can do this because cover crops are like your lawn. When you mow it down, they grow back. This allows the farmer to control the density of cover crops on their land 
while still collecting valuable plant matter that is rich in oil. And leaves are always present on the plants, and that too in greater quantities compared to seeds. And this abundance is the key factor to making oil production more sustainable and economical. These successfully engineered cover crops can be grown anywhere, be it your farmland, yard, but the best part is farmers can harvest them whenever they want. They don't need to wait for the seeds. Hmm. Right now, some of you may have thinking, well, we understand the benefits of high oil production on cover crop leaves. But this is still biodiesel, not gasoline. You may be thinking, we drive a car, not a tractor, and we need eco-friendly gasoline. This brings us to our third and final major innovation, which is modifying plant oil structure. The reason you can't go to the grocery store, take that vegetable oil and chuck it in your gas tank and expect your car to run <laughs> is because those carbon chains are too long. Now, what do I mean by that? Plant oils exist mostly in the form of something called a triglyceride. Triglycerides are made up of fatty acids, which are made up of carbon chains. These carbon chains are what fuel your vehicle. For example, gasoline has an average carbon chain length of 7 to 10 carbons. Like Stu just mentioned, plant oils are too long, usually 16 to 18 carbon in their chain. Diesel fuel is 15 carbon long, which is why most of you hear about the use of plant oil as biodiesel all the time. But the gasoline engine needs shorter chain oil, usually 7 to 10 carbon in their chain. Therefore, our strategy is to produce this shorter chain oil on cover crop leaves. And we will call them ecotag oil. Ecotag oil will be designed to work with the system we have right now, like cars, planes, and power plants. And although ecotag oils will function like traditional fossil fuels, the resulting emissions will be greatly reduced because they're coming from plants or cover crops. Because ecotag oils will be plant-based, each year that we plant and harvest our cover crops, the carbon will be actively recycled rather than permanently emitted. And to do this, we'll use a plant many of you are probably aware of. Coconut. Uh, what's so special about coconut, Poonam? So coconut has the ability to produce oils which are rich in medium chain fatty acids. Hmm. Now what does that mean? The average chain length of soybean oil is 18 carbons. But the average chain length in coconut oil is 12 carbons. And these 12 carbons are much closer to the usable fuel or gas. Our strategy is to harness those genes from coconut, apply them in cover crop, and produce the oil of desired chain length. This oil can act as a substitute for petroleum. One more thing, you can use that oil in your car as well. We did it. We solved it. <laughs> but hold on. We can lie. Words are cheap. We can say whatever we want up here. <laughs> is this actually possible? And we are closer than you may think. In a variety called Nicotiana, scientists were able to develop a plant that had high oil, over 30% by mass. We want to take this technology and apply it to a variety of cover crops to achieve similar levels of oil. And with this rate, which Stu has mentioned, if we grow ecotag on all the farmland available in the United States, you won't believe. We can produce more than enough fuel to power all the cars of states. Wow. <laughs> but let's be realistic. In US, most of the farmland are not currently growing cover crops. You may be surprised to know that ecotag oils from just 20% farmland can still fuel quarter of all gas cars in this country. But forget about gas car for a second and think about only electric car. Ecotag oils from just 20% farmland can power 300 million electric cars every year. And that is equivalent to one electric car 
for every citizen in U.S. And we haven't even mentioned about the reduction in carbon emission. In 2022, United States produced 1 billion ton of carbon emission just by driving. With EcoTag, not only we can reduce this large chunk of carbon emission, we can also fulfill the fuel demands. With our big idea, we can create a future where sustainable gas meets our needs without harming our precious environment. We don't have a lot of time to figure this out, so let's embrace this opportunity to create a brighter and cleaner tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. Wow. I, I am totally blown away by this presentation. And, and let me tell you why. You, you've identified a big problem. A big problem that obviously needs a very significant solution. You've taken on something very significant, but yet you've come up with a very bold but stretch solution. You know, th this is what I would characterize as not just best practice, but next practice. Because you, you, you're challenging us to, to think differently. You're challenging us to, to really find a solution that is supportable, that is accessible, that enables you know, everybody anywhere in the world to be able to gain access to this. But my, my question to you is this. How, how fresh is this idea? Have there been have, you, have there been conversations, have there been discussions that have looked into how to take this from concept to reality? And, and, in, and in responding to that particular question, I want you to tell me, in terms of timeline from now till, till we get it rolling, how long do you think it'll take for us to be able to make this a reality? Sure, thank you. Let me, let me try to answer your question. Um, Maybe you guys can jump on. Come to your first question, that cover crops and use of cover crop is kind of new idea. Uh, farmers are trying to go more about more cover crops nowadays to protect their soil, basically, and to improve their soil. Because some of the cover crops are legume, which can fix nitrogen. That means it can improve the soil. And Currently, I think 7 to 8 percent of the farmland in the U.S. only use the cover crops. But which is increased. Uh, it was a decade ago, it was like 1 or 2 percent. So this is kind of fresh idea. And then also the idea of the oil in leaves is also fresh idea because few years back, um, kind of 7 to 10 years back, first time oil is produced in the Nicosiana, um, which we presented. So this idea also is fresh. So I think in total, whole idea is kind of fresh idea. And to extend on that, we have companies like Covercrest that build oil seed cover crops. Yes. Uh, so again, we mentioned the problem with seeds and planting food crops. So we want to extend this technology into plant leaves to really take advantage of not having to wait. Um, so there have been conversations about this, and there have been people moving towards this. The real bottleneck is having the resources and funding to create these plants, because designing and generating these plants is hard for any researcher. So this is really what we're trying, what we're waiting on, trying to develop. And coming to the second part, which was like how long it will take. Yeah. So uh, that question itself has a two part. One is how long it will take to generate those lines or generate those plants. And second one is about regulation. So in the lab, uh, it will take three to five years to generate those plants and transfer them to the field. But then second part is about the regulation. So because it's not a food crop, so we believe or we are anticipating that it won't take that much time compared to the food crops. Thank you. Yeah, one thing I'm very impressed with is a lot of the ag tech technology doesn't bring the farmer into it or think about their bottom line. So I want to congratulate you for thinking about the farmer and also making sure that 
they have an additional revenue stream for their farms. I think that makes it more feasible. Um, other than the farmer, what do you think the biggest barrier would be to quick implementation of your idea? Oh, so I, I love this question. I've always believed if you can make a solution that also makes you money, their like, barriers will evaporate. If a farmer can find out <laughs> that they can make money off of this, they will jump to it. Uh, and they won't need to rely on grants or you know, goodwill gestures from governments. Um, so I, I really think that if we can get this to work and we can show it, that it will quickly take root everywhere. Yeah, That's so, a pun. OK, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You're done. So um, I was reading an article why US farmer doesn't grow so much of cover crops. Because according to them, it's kind of waste of labor because they need to do the seeding. Although they doesn't need to do a lot of fertilizers and pesticide, low maintenance crops, these, these things are. But they still need to do the seeding, and then they still need to do the harvesting. But when farmers will know that they can earn like $400 to $500 per acre, and if a average farmer has 400 acre of land, they are going to do it. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you guys. You've wonderful concept. You've challenged us to find a solution that is lasting, and you have to be congratulated for that. Well done, and thank you. Thank you. Let's hear it for Team Ecotag. Well done. Just a quick reminder for everybody before we begin our next presentation to please silence cell phones out of respect for each of the teams. Thank you very much. Why do we have food disparity? And who is affected? How can education bridge the gap of access in agriculture? Isn't it time to rethink how the needs for food in underserved and disenfranchised communities are met? Our big idea is to relieve food disparity by creating a network of living laboratories to focus on local community needs. My name is Zach Stafford, and I'm from Belleville, Illinois. My name is Curly Taylor, and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. My name is Antonio Brazelton, and I'm from Huntsville, Alabama. And we are Team Watley from the JJK Fan. I can still hear the disappointment in my grandmother's voice the first time I told her I wanted to study agriculture. <laughs> you mean like farming? We tried that before, baby. Are you sure you don't want to be a doctor or an engineer? See, my grandmother grew up sharecropping with her family during the late 1940s. She was certainly no stranger to agriculture or the plight of black farmers in the Jim Crow South. Although I didn't fully understand her words at the time, today I think she was trying to expose me to a broader truth about the complexities of the science I've grown to love. As Danforth community members, we exist in two worlds. In one world, we work among the nation's foremost experts in plant science to create solutions that will revolutionize the global food system. From Wi-Fi enabled harvesting equipment to precision gene editing, we witness the power of next generation agriculture daily. This is in stark contrast to the world we re-enter on our commute home. In this world, the realities of food apartheid, urban blight, and nutritional health disparity grow more and more prevalent with each passing city block. Although conventional agriculture seeks to address this issue by focusing on increased food production, shifting the paradigm of food security requires the next generation of leaders to incorporate systems level solutions that reach across curriculums, communities, and cultures. Our big idea is to relieve food disparity by creating a network of living laboratories, hubs where agriculture influences education, research, community development all across the world, centers that are filled with classrooms and laboratories wait, and all these. Wait, 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 wait. You were doing good. 
Were you listening to anything I just said? I was no. next to you. He couldn't have been listening. <laughs> he, he did. We don't need more laboratories. St. Louis has the most plant science PhDs per capita, and they all work in laboratories on this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They're calling it 39 North or something Some. like that. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. No. no, these are living laboratories, and these are probably different than the traditional laboratories that you and probably the audience are thinking of. Okay. Living laboratories are user-friendly, open innovation ecosystems that focus on the co-creation of beliefs of everybody that can co-create around them. A place where students and educators, community organizers, artists, chefs, everybody can come together and f come to systematically involved to the development of new solutions to meet their community needs. You know, he is right. This kind of work is primarily done in silos with very little reach from outside of the communities that they're in. Our centers will have greenhouses, community gardens, test kitchens, labs for research, storage facilities, and other pertinent needs to that community. Our centers are committed to three important pillars, community autonomy, education, and food justice. Our first pillar is community autonomy. You know, this is the idea that community members should be intricately involved in the decisions that impact how their lives operate on a day-to-day -day basis. But due to social factors and systemic policies, marginalized communities have had to manage and work with the minimal resources to make ends meet. Now more than ever, it is imperative that we give people agency over the spaces in which they live, work, and grow. We believe in working with culturally competent leaders, doers, that believe in changing the perception of agriculture as it pertains to marginalized communities. And I gotta say, guys, I've been thinking. Okay, this should be good. Are you ready for it? I think we should name our centers after Booker T. Watley. Booker T. Washington. He obviously means Booker That's T. Washington. That's what he's thinking. No, <laughs> man, no. Booker T. Watley, Watley, Watley. Washington. Who is Booker T. Watley? <laughs> you guys don't have no idea. This guy. Booker T. Watley was a professor, horticulturalist, author, and pioneer of current sustainable agriculture practices. Continuing the work of the great George Washington Carver at Tuskegee University, Dr. Wally introduced farming practices that allow small holding farmers with limited resources to make the most of their farm. In his famous book, How to Make $100,000 Farming 25 Acres, Dr. Wally explores efficient farm practices that minimize unnecessary costs while maximizing income, all through smart crop selection with community engagement. That's cool. I like That's that. Dr. Wally's work underscores the importance of what community autonomy looks like in marginalized communities. And because of Dr. Wally's efforts, Community-supported agriculture has become a staple when galvanizing communities through agriculture and education. With our centers, we can build off the legacy of Dr. Wiley while ensuring community engagement and community input is the top priority. Our centers will prioritize community autonomy through the development of strategic partnerships, targeted education plans, and democratized research practices. We will equip these communities with the tools to reclaim the virtues that Dr. Wiley practiced. We're actually seeing some of this work being done in East St. Louis at the Jackie Joyner Kersey Food, Agriculture, and Nutrition Innovation Center. Yeah. Good place. Thank you, thank you. It's a good place. I like that place. I like good, that place. Good place to work. Uh, <laughs> but what if we could take a similar model with the JJK and amplify it to okay. meet the needs of any community across the country, even the world? Mm -hmm. Building relationships with entities such as nonprofits, schools, universities, community centers, business leaders, farmers. We can create a group of mission-driven players that are dedicated to creating a vibrant ag ecosystem. Our mission is to meet people where they are and to give them the tools to reclaim the virtues that Dr. Wally practiced through the development of our Watley Centers. Watley Center, okay. I'm really happy that you brought education into the talking because our second pillar is education. And to accomplish with this with education, we need to recognize that states like Missouri and Illinois, students' test scores are dropping rapidly in math and science. In our bi-state area alone, despite agriculture being the fastest growing sector, Missouri and Illinois has almost seen a 10-point percentage drop in students who meet the basic standards in STEM. So how do we prepare the students for the next fastest growing sector? Well, engaging students as early as possible 
is important for students to learn what exactly is in their arsenal. In education, we have a saying, students don't know what they don't know. And sure. as educators, we're really slow to respond. It's up to us to find new and exciting ways to mold the future leaders of America. But there are some barriers and some challenges. This is Jordan. And Jordan is a great student with strong ambitions to succeed. But unfortunately, living laboratories just do not exist in his community yet. While doing his research, Jordan had traveled 30 minutes across town to the Donald Danforth Center from his community in East St. Louis just to find the space and scientists needed that could help him with his science project. Luckily, Jordan was able to connect with Andrea Evans' lab here right at Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, and Jordan's research focused on the role of leaf architecture in the implementation of crop production in corn. And he's only a sophomore. This experience has led to multiple competitions across the Midwest where he actually won the best paper session in the Illinois Junior Academy of State Science in Illinois. Yeah. That's impressive. That's impressive. That means that his presentation, despite his circumstances, was one of the most, most 20 top presentations in the state of Illinois. You know, but what if Jordan could do research right in the heart of his community? What if researchers like Andrea and educators like you, Zach, had a space where you can carve out and you can work with students like Jordan on a day-to-day -day basis? We believe that engaging students require special facilities that marry science and education together. Wadley centers were strategically placed in communities where students can explore their curiosities and practice science in an ever-changing world. Each facility would be equipped with greenhouses, growing spaces, research development, so that researchers like Antonio and students like Jordan can work together. Schools could visit our sites and do hands-on activities and learn about agriculture projects in their own communities. Our centers will be a staple to not only food production, but only scientific outreach to the communities that need it the most. You know, I'm really excited that you mentioned using our platform to actually feed communities. That's why our third pillar is food justice. Nationally, 10% of American adults are food insecure. And in urban centers like Metro St. Louis, upwards of 60% of residents have limited access to fresh, healthy produce. This is Darissa Davis, and she is actively working in her community to combat this issue. Darissa operates a community garden in Washington Park, East St. Louis. Her garden was actually born from ideas not too far distant than the one we're presenting tonight, to plant the seeds that will grow her community. See, grocery stores are few and far in between in Darissa's community, and many people rely on convenience stores for local produce. As a teacher, Darissa saw this as an immediate call to action. She and her students form a one they, they farm a 1.3 acre lot that actually used to be a storage facility. Mm. Darissa is sharing this space with the public. She partners with organizations and student volunteers to both upkeep and develop the garden. They planted sto staple foods like tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, even fruit trees that they're hoping will bloom in the years to come. Mm. Yeah. On her property, there's an abandoned building that she wants to use as a market and test kitchen to serve soup and salads to the local community. And honestly, I think we could help with that. Yeah, we, we can. You know, with our centers, Darissa and other hardworking community members who normally would have to work on these spaces alone or with sporadic help would have the support and structure needed to assist and grow their gardens. We would support Darissa and make sure that she had additional volunteers and resources to scale up her production, her fruit production in her community. We could also connect Darissa with researchers to help collaborate on funding and other grant efforts. You know what? I was thinking, we could probably serve as a seed storage facility also. That way Darissa doesn't have to purchase seeds every year. I like it. Community members can assist in taking care of her produce 
What she produces can find those who need nutritional and fresh food the most. With our centers, Darissa's dream can be fully supported and expanded to create new spaces that also benefit her community. So, take all of our ideas tonight and imagine a world where Watley centers serve communities across the country. Hubs where communities have spaces dedicated to tackling their needs through agriculture. A Watley Center in Cincinnati where first graders learn about plants by growing hydroponic vegetables to stock their fridges at home. Or a central hub in Detroit where meetings happen to identify new community growing spaces. Mm. I think we need to think bigger. A seed bank where farmers in Mexico City can save and source locally adapted drought tolerant seeds. How about a research center right here in St. Louis, where scientists study in nutrient cycling and different varieties of kale, alongside a workforce development program that specializes in rooftop gardens? All right, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. A logistics program that sustainably transports produce from vertical gardens in Queens to nearby black-owned restaurants in Brooklyn. Now, imagine all of these centers and all the people who work with them talking, collaborating, sharing ideas, and making sure that tackling, they're tackling some of the world's largest problems from the bottom up. We believe that feeding the world is as much about challenging the boundaries of technology as it is about challenging the boundaries of the social environments that they exist in. Our big idea will transform the way marginalized communities see the growing space around them. By cultivating agriculture centers based on community autonomy, education, and food justice, we can empower people with essential scientific skills, education, and resources to meet the broader community's needs in an ever-changing world. We, we are, are Team Watley. Join, Join us, us as, as we, we embark, embark on this journey. journey. Thank you. Wow, wow, nicely done, nicely done. I really, I think, you know, it's so important that you all have really, you know, want, looked into these marginalized communities and saying how can we bring the whole community together to solve for this, you know, what, in a way that, you know, that, that, that combines kind of the education and the food justice, the agricultural opportunities that are here. So, and of course, you know what, I love the work that is happening at JJK FAM, right? You know what? So talk a little bit, take me, because some of this work is happening there, right? And so take us through how the work that you're doing today and how we really bring this to life. Well, I think that our idea came out of the work that we're doing at the JJK FAM. I mean, we're very passionate mm -hmm. about all the things that we're doing. I think for our big idea, it could be implemented anywhere. It could be implemented in a school, a farm. It could be implemented you know, on a community garden. Um, not just a community center like JJK Fan, though they're also elevating that. But I think our idea can like, transition into multiple avenues and you know, help people in scalability-wise and everything. So. And I think it also comes from that we're not alone. You know, we are serving just one community out of the hundreds that are plaguing our country currently. And you know, we need to realize that in the next, in our lifetime, we're gonna have a food shortage if we don't A, identify new growing spaces, and B, tackle it for the people who need it the most. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, I, I love the idea of community autonomy, education, and food justice. You, you've touched the major tenets of, of, of needs. But you know, as, a, as an educator, I'm excited about that linkage as well. And so I want you all to envision for me here how we could replicate this concept in, in all the cities and communities that you've, you've, you've listed there. What would be your one, two step in sort of moving this thing from concept to fruition? Yeah. I think one of the major pieces that we have to think about when we're talking about from concept to fruition with this is almost piggybacking on what we talked about before, is ensuring that we are actively bringing the community and bringing the people who are at the forefront of these initiatives along with us at the beginning. 
right? I think there are a lot of really good initiatives that start well that don't have these people in the room and they fail and they fall flat in those spaces. And so I think by focusing on community autonomy, figuring out what community needs are and actively bringing them along with us as active participants and partners in this place, uh, I think that gives us the best opportunity to move from concept, things we want to do, to actual fruition. Okay. I have a question about scalability. So do you feel like with the work you're doing at JJK that you know sort of what the minimum requirements are, requirements are going to be to take the Watley Center and locate it in other places? Do you feel like it's kind of like a center in a box where you can go and sell it in Detroit? and you can go to New York, or will each one be customized based on the community need? Customized, I, so yeah, customized. I mean, each, each community, even though they're, be, they're tackling similar problems, each community is unique in their own way. And to do that, you really need to find the people within the community who are passionate about these topics, which is part of our education, to breed some of that, that passion into this, um, as well as making sure that each unique community need they have is addressed by those community members. Yeah. I, think to that, oh, go ahead. I think to that point, um, a larger part of that is actually playing into the cultural relevancy part, yeah. right? Um, each of these communities is different. Either, each of the community growing spaces is different. And where we see a lot of the disconnect between agricultural innovation and food access, food disparity is I think some of that cultural connection, right? Are we growing and creating a market that is relevant to the people that we're looking to be involved with? And so I think with this concept, we're building it together and that gives us an opportunity to be scalable and address specific needs. Exactly. All right, thank you so, thank much. You so much. Great job. Let's hear it for Team Watley. Well done. Using today's technology to figure out how many chemicals are in the plant kingdom is almost like counting stars in the sky before powerful telescopes. Without powerful instrumentation and creative science, how would you detect the hundreds of thousands of chemical compounds in plants? Could discovery and understanding of all plant compounds be the key to unlocking a future of more sustainable agriculture? Our big idea is to develop a new generation of tools to reveal the vast universe of plant compounds that can be harnessed to improve the human condition. I'm Lewis Connolly from Springfield, Illinois. I'm Alan Hubbard from Newtown, Connecticut. I'm Brittany Millman from St. Louis, Missouri, and we're Team Metabolify from the Baxter Lab. My dad grew up on a farm outside of the bustling metropolis of Assumption, Illinois. My grandfather would make him, my aunt, and uncle walk the field and pick weeds. Now, hearing this story as a kid, I thought my dad was nuts. I could not understand his fascination with that land and the crops that grew on it. In fact, he had to bribe my siblings and I with candy in order to get us to get into the family minivan and take the hour-long drive out to the farm. And when that candy ran out, well, my siblings and I would end up in a sugar rush frenzy asking our dad questions. How many plants are in the field? Do plants eat dirt? What are plants made of? And my dad, who didn't need sugar to fuel his enthusiasm, would answer every single one of our questions. And that dynamic would continue as we walked through the field with my dad looking for signs of water damage in low spots, corn boring insects, or tar spot fungus. Today, I find myself asking one of those seemingly simple questions I asked my dad all those years ago. What are plants made of? We first encounter plants when we are young, and they shape our earliest memories. Like a night sky filled with constellations, they are both an introduction to the wonders of the world, but also a gateway to scientific frontiers we don't often appreciate as children. And I think I can prove it. So I'd like to ask a question. Can you please raise your hand if you or anybody you know has been impacted by cancer of any type? I certainly can. My grandpa, my girlfriend's mother, plenty of people that I have known and loved 
I saw enough hands to know that. We all feel the same way. Anybody who doesn't think that plant chemistry shapes the human condition has never been asked that question. And I'll explain why. Pacific U is the source of Taxol, a first line treatment in breast, lung, and ovarian cancer. May apple is the source of etoposide, a crucial drug for lung and testicular cancer. And Madagascar periwinkle is where we get vincristi, a drug that has helped bring up the survival rate of childhood leukemia from 10% to 90%, an absolutely incredible statistic. 40% of the pharmaceuticals we use today are derived from plant chemicals we call metabolites. Now, <laughs> these are not only used to treat cancer, but also pain management, diabetes, malaria, and many other ailments. However, despite their incredible importance to people, we only know a few metabolites in plants. Experts estimate that there are hundreds of thousands of metabolites across the entire plant kingdom. Yet with our current technology, we can't even detect 10% of them. Imagine if we could detect more. Think of all the new medicines we would have. More importantly, think of all the lives we could save. So why is it in an age where we can sequence all the DNA in a person in a matter of hours, we know so little about something so important as the untapped potential of plant metabolites? Well, the only reason we know so much about DNA is because of a revolutionary technology invented about 40 years ago that unfortunately can't be applied to plant metabolites. The technology I'm talking about is called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR for short. And what PCR allows us to do is take a single piece of DNA and apply the copy and paste mechanism of cell division to it such that we can amplify it a billion times over and we have enough DNA to put to work. This amplification mechanism has, has allowed us to detect viruses, like all those different strains of COVID. It's allowed us to detect tests for cancer, helping patients get the care they need as fast as possible. It's even allowed us to resurrect ancient dinosaurs. Well, not yet, but keep an eye out. <laughs> all of this to say, if we had a PCR analog for plant metabolites, what could we do? Who knows? The fact of the matter is without an amplification mechanism, we'll never be able to realize any of this potential. Thanks to PCR, we can now see DNA as a strand of four repeating letters. But the machine that detects metabolites sees it more as a faint blur. It's like trying to count the stars in the sky before the invention of telescopes. What we see is but the edge of a scientific frontier. These challenges were all news to me when in 2018, during a job interview with then fourth faculty, the eyes of the late Todd Mockler lit up as he described a years long vision to me. A plan to search thousands of plants for thousands of metabolites so that we could find the most important ones and put them to work for agriculture. The details were a little vague, but he, <laughs> he believed we could create a new generation of crops resistant to drought and resilient in a changing climate. I was absolutely hooked. It inspired me to move 1,500 miles from the East Coast here to St. Louis to join the Danforth Center and its community <laughs> of cutting edge plant scientists. By 2020, things were not exactly going as planned for <laughs> reasons other than a global pandemic, <laughs> believe it or not. Less than halfway through the thousands of plants, I realized we had a serious problem. Existing software simply could not track the thousands of faint metabolite signals that fluctuated in and out of detection at each plant. Few scientists had dared track more than a handful of metabolites across a couple dozen of samples. And here I was with thousands of each. Without a way to amplify metabolites the way that DNA is amplified by PCR, I faced the impossible challenge of trying to find thousands of needles in thousands of haystacks. <laughs> <laughs> so I did what I usually do when stuck. 
I went for a bike ride <laughs> one spring day in 2020. I remember thinking that at least the roads are clear from a lockdown as I <laughs> put on my helmet. I was about uh, 20 miles into the ride with my head down, pedaling up a familiar hill, wondering what exactly I was doing with my life. <laughs> When all of a sudden, I was startled by a whoosh as a fellow cyclist shot past me. He had clearly run through the stop sign at the start of the hill, which is illegal, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> but the worst part is, he was substantially older than me. You can't do that, I, I yell in my head, and my competitive instinct rages. I know there's one and only one thing I can do. I need to win. So I grip my teeth, I surge towards him. We are neck and neck, fighting the gradient. Until with the final surge, I soar clear over the top of the hill, triumphant. But here's the thing, the roads were still slick from a passing thunderstorm. <laughs> So when I look over my shoulder victoriously, <laughs> I go head over handlebars. Several hours later, thanks to a good Samaritan in urgent care, <laughs> I find myself back home, strung out in between doses of Vicodin as my broken elbow swells agonizingly against the splint. Trying to stay optimistic, I returned to the problem from before the bike ride, when my life was easier. <laughs> the thousands of needles in thousands of haystacks. <laughs> it hasn't gone anywhere. It's just now that I have you know, half the chance of figuring it out as before, because I need two hands to write code. And I only have one. <laughs> Everybody else's algorithms had try to find faster ways to sift the millions of haystacks. But these missed a lot of the needles, and they required thousands of lines of code. And there was no way I could attempt something like that in my current state. I needed a different way to look at the problem, something simpler to turn the problem around so that I could make some progress now. And it hit me. Not the pavement this time, <laughs> but a big idea. It was true that there were thousands of pieces of hay for each needle, but they were microscopic and random. They were random enough that if you were to zoom in in each haystack individually, you would see that no two haystacks had a piece of hay in exactly the same place. But the needles, though just as microscopic, would always be in the same place. This meant that paradoxically at first, if I added together all of my haystacks, I got more needles. It didn't matter if I couldn't physically amplify metabolites. I could do it using statistics instead. All of a sudden, the problem transformed. There were a thousandfold fewer haystacks. The needles were much larger. And I could start attacking it with one hand. Fast forward a few weeks, and that's where I come in. I was an intern starting at the Danforth Center in the Baxter Lab when one day, Alan asked if he could talk through something with me. And while we sat down over Zoom, my curiosity was piqued because I could tell that Alan was visibly excited. And I listened to his presentation, and at the end, I have to admit, I was pretty confused. <laughs> it seemed to me like Alan had taken data from different samples, overlapped them, and then said, amazing, right? <laughs> And in a way, it, it kind of was. It was a solution that was so simple that no one else had ever thought to try it, at least with metabolites. Turns out, there's a similar concept in photography called image stacking. You take multiple photos of the same location and overlay them using software. It increases the signal of the subject so it's much more clear. We put together some code to execute this strategy in metabolites. And we now call this software Metablify. Now, with the seemingly insurmountable problem of signal amplification out of the way, we could turn our imaginations towards bringing this technology to the rest of the world. In Fortune 500 companies, from America to China, 
Hundreds of the million dollar machines used to measure metabolites sit underutilized and often dormant, reserved for small and unambitious studies. Our big idea, we'll build the best in class algorithms of Metabolify into a cloud powered software suite that cures analysis paralysis, allowing these machines to be awakened. But Metabolify will not just be a data processing platform. It will also be an interactive data exploration and analysis toolkit. With thousands and thousands of metabolites in any given experiment, researchers need a way to hone in on the most important ones. We will help them do this by providing automated plotting and statistical analysis methods. It is our hope that with these tools, researchers will be able to turn their samples into biological insight in a matter of days rather than weeks or months. What? Freeing, up, oh, <laughs> freeing up brains that were stuck on the problem of data processing, open to explore the budding potential of plant metabolites. And what could these great researchers do now that they are freed from their analysis paralysis? They could start looking for natural insecticides that come from plant metabolites that are non-toxic, made from plants themselves and not factories. We could find other metabolites that are candidates for textiles, potential applications in construction and clothing. And we could keep finding the metabolites that help plants thrive in a changing climate. We believe Metablify will open up a new era in personalized medicine. New treatments, potentially, <laughs> potentially derived from newly discovered metabolites, will be tailored to a person's individual chemistry for complex diseases from depression to cancer. Ultimately, this is what we want out of Metablify, a tool to tie together plant science and human health in a way that not only increases biological understanding, but also helps save lives. Plant-derived pharmaceuticals are especially important to me, as they helped my dad in his fight against cancer. He still goes out to that family farm, by the way, but ever since his recovery, he uses a drone to do his inspection instead of his children. <laughs> Sometimes I get to tag along, which is a lot of fun, and not just because of the drone, but because now he is the one who gets to enthusiastically ask me questions about plants. <laughs> and I get to tell him about a future where we can use Metablify to fuel agricultural and medical advances. I hope you all are as excited as I am about the idea of using plants to help improve all of our lives. Thank you for listening to our big idea, and have a wonderful night. <laughs> Sorry. <about that>. No. <laughs> yeah. That was great. Thank you so much. And I don't know how you managed to make curing cancer, statistics, and bike riding all make some sense <laughs> and, and exciting. But congratulations on that. It was really well explained and, and interesting. So to go back to the analogy with um, the, the genome, so a PCR analog. So what is like the next step you would need to, to kind of kick off the, the process? What is the very next thing that has to happen? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we know plenty of people, collaborators uh, we've met who are both in academia and industry who are these types of people who have tons of big data sets that they don't really know how to analyze. And so we're starting to collaborate with them analyze those data sets you know, to show them all of the, basically the, the gold mine that they have. And we're building out that social network so that we can keep proving the utility of our technique to these you know, great researchers with tons of data sets that they don't know how to leverage. And we think we can turn that into you know, basically a revenue generating service. And we can then use that revenue to fund basically automation of this pipeline into like a globally available software suite. Gosh, there's so much to process here. I mean, no <laughs> pun intended, but it, but it really, you know, and as I think about it, it's like, you're right. It's that how do you take it to the next level? And is there, you know, an, an immediate problem that we say this is this is the one that we're solving for that gets, you know, that gets your idea off the ground, and then, you know, it, obviously you, it takes off from there. What are you thinking about that? Yeah, I think you know what we would like to do is is form a company around which we have this this IP, and we can start allowing 
people who want to do the type of work we've already done to do within their organizations. And one of the problems that they, I think they'd like to solve is trying to find human biomarkers, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so we have pipelines ready to go to help people with that. And yeah, and to chime in on that, another thing is to currently run the code, you need a good understanding of both computers and coding. So what we want to do is change that, make some type of graphical interface that people who know how to use the machines and know a lot about plant chemistry can use the software and utilize it without needing that technical knowledge. Great, thank you. You know, as I, as I looked at the audience tonight, just briefly, and I, it caught my eyes, Arnold Donald, uh, a remarkable researcher that took research and monetized it in a, in a really significant way. If anybody knows what equal is. <laughs> but I, I will say to you, because you, you've got, you got benchmarks like, like Arnold, when you think about this concept, how do you move it from the laboratory, from conceptual science, into something that becomes real, that, that solves problems, that extends life? You know, because I, I think that needs to be at the back of our minds as we, as we, as we move into the, in this journey. What are your concepts? What are your ideas on that? So that's a, a great question. One of the things people would love to do right now, but they you know, really can't, is take, let's say, 10,000 people and look, you know, what, what are the chemicals that are, are in their blood, let's say, and can you correlate that to disease risk? And that generates terabytes of data that other software can't process, but we could handle that right now. So there's a group of people who want to do something like that, look through thousands of people, find the chemicals in their blood that could tell if they're going to get cancer, if they're going to be prone to some sort of disease. We would provide the resources to that organization to be able to process the data. The machines already exist. The machines exist. It's this huge gap between what people want to do and with the software. And, and jumping off of yeah. that, not only would it help in finding people who are prone to certain diseases, it might also help in tailoring the medicine we currently have to people's individual chemistry. So if you've ever tried to get treated for something, you know there are usually multiple ways you could go. And it's kind of a trial and error process to see what ends up working best for you. One of our hopes is that through looking through people's own metabolites, we can find out which treatments work best for which people, so you don't have to go through that trial and error process. Wow. That's fantastic. I mean, I think, you're, I think you really have two big ideas, like customized <laughs> medicine for individuals, and then your technology idea, which is using idle machines to do all of the processing. So, Congratulations, just very interesting. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Let's hear it for Team Metablify. Thank you very much. Okay, um, that was incredible. I know you all feel the same, and you're trying to think now, how can I press all three buttons at the same time to make a vote? Because those are just incredibly creative and inspirational. Each and every one of those teams did a fantastic job. The, the task at hand now is for you to really contemplate which team really connected with you. Uh, what do you think is uh, most interesting, viable, creative? What, what is it that you want to cast your vote for? And here's what's at stake. So this is a competition. The winning team tonight is going to be given a $10,000 grant to further their work and carry on with their big idea. So it's a meaningful challenge that you all are going to have at this point. So at this point, we're ready to vote. And you're going to see some instructions up here. It's pretty simple in the order that we had the teams come up today. So what you're going to be doing is using your clicker. You're going to be selecting one for Team Ecotag, two for Team Watley, or three for Team Metablify. And those of you here in the audience in the Langenberg Theater will use your clickers, and those of you online we'll have a survey tool that you'll be used to do that. We're going to give you about a minute and take some time to contemplate and vote. Good luck.
Okay, everyone, that, that should be enough time. I know it was not an easy decision, but um, thank you. The voting is closed. We'll now uh, begin to tabulate the votes, which will take us a few minutes. And at this time, I would invite uh, Dr. Jim Carrington back to the stage. Jim? Thanks, Chip. Not only thanks, Chip, but this is the third time Chip Lerwick has served as our Master of Ceremonies. Give it up for Chip Lerwick again. <laughs> Janet, Benjamin, Marilyn, let's hear it for you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you all for voting. We forgot to say, vote once. So we hope, uh, in the spirit of fairness, if, if we end up with um, uh, 12,000 votes, we're, we're going to have a minor issue. Uh, but I trust every single one of you. Um, while the votes are being tallied and retallied and audited by the accounting firm of Price Waterhouse, we, we take this seriously. Uh, I want to use this opportunity not just to kill time, but to tell you a little bit about what some of the prior Big Ideas presenters actually did with their work. I'll give you three examples. In uh, 2019, a team from Allison Miller's group watered a seed that had already been planted in their lab. They didn't invent the whole idea, but they fleshed out a big part of it. And as a result of that, that big idea blossomed into a multi-institutional $12.5 million institute grant led by Allison Miller that is seeking to understand how plants and plant roots influence the soil and how the soil acts on plant roots. It's a tremendous program. <laughs> Big idea from the Blake Myers lab was all about new technology to create hybrid crops. Their presentation, even though it wasn't a winning presentation, was so compelling to one individual in the audience that that individual immediately made a $30,000 donation to jumpstart that project in the Myers lab. Now, I'm not saying that you have to give a donation of that size <laughs> if you were found these compelling. However, uh, you know how to get in touch with us. And then third, uh, the Keith Slotkin Lab, uh, uh, which uh, was the winning team from 2019. Uh, that big idea was actually the initial starting point for a transformational change in the Slotkin Lab to develop new ways to uh, insert DNA into plants in a targeted way, in a predictable way, and in a way that has uh, vast economic importance. That project not only initiated an entirely new line of work in the Slotkin Lab, but over the past few years has resulted in $3 million of additional grant funding for that purpose. These big ideas, in so many cases now, really turn into big things happening ideas turning into reality. Now, I think that the votes have been tallied. OK. Um, before we announce the winner, let's bring up the three teams one more time. So <laughs> Team Ecotag, this is Poonam, Somnath, and Stewart. From JJK Fan and Chris Callis Duell's team here at the Danforth Center and the Education Research and Outreach team, welcome again, Team Watley. <laughs> and 
And from the Baxter Lab, give it up for Team Ecotag. Oh, God. I, I told these guys before, just five minutes before, I am the least prepared person in the room. This is Team Metabolify, not Team Ecotag. <laughs> team Ecotag down here, I'm so sorry. Um, I am going to turn my back to the crowd um, and thank every one of you for making me so proud for so much work, so much creativity, so much innovation in these talks, and so much forward vision for all of your talks. I started when you were still out talking about how this was really the very best of the Danforth Center on display. Thank you for proving me right. And now let me welcome the last two that are going to uh, uh, be on stage tonight, two special people. First, uh, Ann Phillips. Ann was a member of the winning 2017 Big Ideas team. Ann is a scientist at one of our local companies called New Leaf Symbiotics. And she was a graduate student uh, uh, from Becky Bart's lab. Um, also, um, Kashuk Panda was a member of the 2019 winning team from the Keith Slotkin Lab, that project, that team that changed the course of the Slotkin Lab. Uh, Kashuk is now a scientist uh, down the street, a computational scientist at Bayer. So, Ann, Kashuk, come on up. And Please do the honor of letting us know who won Big Ideas 3.0. <laughs> <laughs> All I can say, Anne, is I am so glad we are not competing this year. <laughs> you guys were amazing. I completely agree, Kaushik. Uh, each of these teams has been truly inspirational. Thank you all for presenting today. Uh, and with that, it is my great honor to present the 2023 Big Ideas uh, winner uh, here at the Danforth Plant Science Center. And the name of the winning team is on this piece of paper. <laughs> and the winner of Big Ideas 3.0 is Team Metallify from the back to the <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> okay, that's it. Give it up for these great teams and Team Metablify. What an outstanding night. Thank you very much for coming out to see Big Ideas 3.0. Enjoy the evening, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>